because I used to be driven by achievement in the sense that it was very much like, you know, get get to these milestones, get to these milestones. And I'd find every single time I got to a specific milestone, it would go, like the fulfillment would go away in, in two seconds. You know, like I'd win an award or I'd do something really cool. I would just forget about it within the space of a matter of hours. I, th I think the best one was, and I only realized this probably a couple months ago in the sense like I published, I think I published two books at the same time. I literally forgot about them the same day, like published them, just didn't even think about it. Welcome to the Sevo Show. We have Jack Anderson on the podcast today. He is a 22 year old boy, now <laughs> becoming a man. And uh, he reached out to me. So I'm just gonna uh, pretty much read what he's told me. A five time author, Nonprofit director, independent filmmaker, ninja warrior, and sports commentator. And there's a whole more things to it. Uh, he's written some year 12 textbooks, which got my attention. Chemistry and maths, my mm. two favorite subjects, <laughs> um, if physics was not in the equation. And uh, he's able to uh, support hundreds of disadvantaged students and has his own online platform with more than 80,000 annual users. Damn, that's a good resume for a 22-year-old. Thanks, bro. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Thanks for, for supporting uh, Street X. <laughs> um, I yeah, think I the didn't, last didn't plan that one. That's yeah. right. That's all right. It's fine. Um, Street X. Uh, Jackson Pryor on the podcast previously with a Street X shirt. So uh, lots of uh, lots of Street X fans being mm. in Perth. So yeah, but um, yeah, spawned in, and uh, you're a baby when you spawn in, of and course. then you you grow conscious, you grow a personality, and <laughs> You started to become more intelligent over the years. Uh, which school did you go to? Oh, I went to, I went to Wesley College. Yeah. Where else did you go? Were you I grew up in Kalgoorlie. Oh, okay. So I spawned in in Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union, migrated yeah. to here, escaped the gulag with my mother Fun. and uh, ended up in a in a sort of uh, country gulag in, <laughs> yeah. in Australia. That's but crazy. I, I ended up all right. We're talking about this off camera before mm. the difference between kids and the disadvantages they have depending on where they spawn in. You were spawned yeah. in a good spot. I was, I was in a good spot. I was spawned in a little bit of a uh, how are you spot and yeah. then migrated to another country spot. My advantages of that was I was able to bring myself across three different types of people. Mm. The ethnics, the countries and now the cities. And being a teacher, I was able to teach in private schools and public schools. I much prefer public schools with the kids were less vanilla. Yeah. Enough, you know, Definitely be a bit more interesting. Though. You know, I mean, Jack Anderson, very <laughs> vanilla name. But you're definitely not vanilla for the what you've done in your 22 years of life so far. You know, Thanks, most man. people have not done that in a lifetime. So how, apart from being in a private school, which you say yeah. has given you a good advantage... Um, like a head start in life, um, you obviously leveraged that and made the most of it Definitely. and didn't just rely on your parents, right? No. So shout outs to your parents to yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. But what do you think happens when someone that spawns in well goes to a private school and doesn't do the right thing? Do you see that a lot? Yeah, no, definitely. I think, um, man, because I, I think about this all the time in terms of what – I don't think people do the wrong thing necessarily. Like obviously a lot of kids aren't academically inclined and then they discover drugs and alcohol at a very young age and it kind of just messes with their brain and and they kind of really pursue that wrong path, which I see a lot from kids in private schools. But I think the other half is, you know, they lean into that privilege and they say, no, I studied really hard in school. I did really well. Then they go get like a job in an investment bank or as as an engineer. And and I think that's totally fine. But I think the, the way in which I saw it and which was, you know, I always could have been an engineer. I, I could have been like an investment banker. It wouldn't have been that hard for me to be like, because I just have so many inherent privileges where I've, I've been privately educated. I live at home throughout my university degree. Of, of course I can go get a, a stock standard job. Um, I kind of saw it as the other way of saying, hey, maybe I should think about how I can go about helping other people and actually making a difference and, and realizing that maybe I was given this privilege for a reason. Maybe it wasn't just to make more money. Yeah, make the most of it. Yeah, yeah, no, make definitely. most of it. So that's a rarity as well. <laughs> oh yeah, which is good. Um, and then you've embraced it. Um, do you feel like uh, you you don't have as much hustle, or have you just made it so that there's all the hustle that you can have? Because your hustle is hard. Yeah. No, I think I'm, I've always been, in, and so is the rest of my family. Like my my parents are from an entrepreneurial background, so. Mm. 
just always having that kind of, I, I love a challenge. Like I thrive on uncertainty and I love pivoting as we were kind of talking off podcast. I, I really enjoy being out of my comfort zone and really giving things a go. So, mm -hmm. so I've always been like that in the sense that I've always loved to kind of push myself. But I think recently, and, and this is the scary part in the sense that I've really been pushing myself in the past, but over probably the last probably three or four months as I've kind of been in reflecting, I've come to understand the, the, the passion and strength I gain from being altruistic. And, and really, if, if I tear down that mirror that kind of I look at myself and I just focus on helping other people, my drive just goes up exponentially. And um, I'm really excited to kind of see what happens if I just really lean into it. Yeah, amazing, <laughs> amazing. So you've got a non-for-profit. Yeah. And uh, just for the viewers, what is a non-for-profit? What is a non-for-profit? Yeah. Um, well, it's gonna, it's probably not going to come across as great for me, but I guess the best way I'd put it is, you know, you're not, you're not there to make a lot of money. Like it's all the money goes back into running the organization and you can pay staff wages and stuff. But for the most part, it's, it's something created with altruistic intentions and to do good in the world. And you're not trying to make money. Like there's no real capacity for you to make millions and, and billions of dollars as an individual running a non-for-profit. So that's the best way I look at it, but I don't know the actual stock standard definition. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Um, and, uh, what is the goal for you for your twenties? And we'll unwind Ooh. this question later. Man, that's, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, I think like yourself, I just, I really, I just love pushing myself and going for the limits, but I think I, I see it kind of happening through two avenues in terms of what I want to do. The first one is definitely make a, a transformational difference in education, which is what something that I've seriously been working towards for the last three years now is got out of school, realized how horrible my school experience was. And I'm like, cool, I'm going to do everything in my power to make this easier for young people because man, school's rough for yes. a lot of young kids. Um, so definitely see myself just pushing that way through through the work that we're doing at Elucidate, through all the other ambitions that I'm currently working on on the side. And then, but I'd say the second half is just to have fun and to, again, I, I'm, I have a tendency to take life quite seriously and I can get quite caught up in my own work and, and just to kind of have that other side of saying, hey, just make sure you save time for just hobbies and, and relationships and people um, and travels. So it's, it's finding that balance and, and that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a missus? <laughs> No, not at the moment. Oh, not at the moment. <laughs> easy, easy. So tell me um, what it's like being a 22-year-old that has all these things on his plate that, uh, yeah, what is your day-to-day -day like? Talk me through it. Man, yeah, every, every day is different. Um, like seriously, it. I, I have a to-do list of like 100 things, but I, I'm pretty good at whittling it down. I reckon for the most part, I, I structure, every day is different, but a lot of it's just writing. I think whether I'm, cause I do a lot of speaking, I do a lot of writing. Um, I'm currently writing all my scholarship applications. You know, I've still got a university degree going on. I've got to pay the bills with, with just like doing basic tutoring um, at the moment. Um, I'm getting funding for the organization and I'm managing people. So a bit like yourself, it, it never, the problem is it never ends. Like in terms yeah. of the workload, it never goes away. Um, but it, it seriously is, I think the only stock standard thing I have is, you know, get up at 6 a.m., go get a coffee, um, sit there for like, 10 minutes and just think, oh, what am I about to do today? And then just go after it. Have you got any assistance or anything about that yet? No, not at the moment. Um, definitely don't have the financial means for that one. Um, I think the beauty of like running a non-for-profit though is we've got 40 volunteers in our, in our organization at the moment. So, you know, the work can be spread well, but I think the problem is, is, you know, we're writing so many textbooks, we're creating films, we're making all the online content for all students across Australia. It's the work never ends, so yeah. That is amazing. Yes. So you're saying you got a degree and you're also looking for scholarships. You're heading to the States, hopefully. Yeah, that's the goal. I reckon um, that's because like, I think all of us have a lot of smaller dreams, but that's always been my dream for a long time is ever since I was 19. I was like, I really want to attend a US or, or UK college like Oxford or Stanford or Harvard or something. And I think the key underlying motivation, because I remember saying this to my mum three years ago, it's like, mum, I, I will be the least naturally talented person to get into one of these schools, which now I've just come to understand is people just perceive natural talent when it's just work over many years for the most part. Um, so it's just been my goal ever since. And, um, you know, bringing that into fruition is seriously life-changing, hopefully, um, in terms of 
I think it's it's about the people that you surround yourself with at the end of the day. It's like it's like having powerful chats like these where like I get to meet yeah. yourself and 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 walk away energized and the opportunity to have that every single day at one of those schools would just be incredible. Yeah. And what are you hoping to get out of it at the end of uh, the scholarship? Yeah. So so the goal is to do hopefully a lot of the degrees so like at Harvard and Stanford or or Oxford they all come under a masters of education in learning design innovation and technology or or one of those kind of um, umbrella categories, but the idea of learning design is understanding how to construct things that actually are, are beneficial to young people. So it's actually taking a very kind of engineering learning design approach of, okay, how do I create the best learning edu- like ed tech company? How do I create resources that young people can use? How do I structure life education, films and videos and content to actually help people? What are the, the fundamental principles? Yeah. Um, so I hope to actually learn that kind of key stuff, but I think more so it's the people. Like I'm, I'm a man of ideas and I, I have so many that I want to execute on and and meeting with the world changes, meeting with the people who have come from all across the globe, you know, like they get people from 30 different countries to come together at these schools and to have people who have had different experiences in education systems to kind of converge together, get their perspectives and most importantly, work with those people because I don't have, I've got altruistic atten- intentions with education. I'm not really trying to make a giant ed tech company that makes billions of dollars. I'm trying to actually do good. So I see the opportunity to link up with people who see that in the same kind of light. And yeah, it, I, I guess I just got to get in. That's the first step. Yeah. And that's a big step. It is a big step. <laughs> yeah. Once you're in there, you can just start talking to anybody and it could be the most casual conversation. Yeah. You can meet the most random person and you never know who they are. And then they could be that person mm. that you're looking for. Or they can link you with that person. Yeah. So that's where you got to treat everybody with, you know, love and respect. Definitely. So you say you come from a place of empathy. That's how you operate. Tell yeah. me more about that. I think for a long time, because I was actually driven, because I used to be driven by achievement in the sense that it was very much like, you know, get get to these milestones, get to these milestones. And I'd find every single time I got to a specific milestone, it would go, like the fulfillment would go away in, in two seconds. You know, like I'd win an award or I'd do something really cool and it w- I would just forget about it within the space of a matter of hours. I, th- I think the best one was, and I only realized this probably a couple months ago in the sense like I published, I think I published two books at the same time. I literally forgot about them the same day, like published them, just didn't even think about it. And to me, that was kind of crazy in the sense that I'm like, man, the reason I'm not getting an, a great deal of satisfaction is, in my life is because I'm so centered on achievement. Um, and then I kind of thought back to all the things that brought me deep fulfillment. And it was those times when people came up to me and said, hey, like, I really appreciate what you've done for me or just those moments that I've genuinely helped people. Um, so the idea of empathy and, and driving through that is, is kind of my key motive now in the sense that I really feel like young people have been dealt an incredibly bad hand in the sense of they live through social media. They have a school system that kind of crushes their spirit and it's just a really hard place for young people de- to deal with right now. And yeah. we can look at it and, and tell them the things that they're not doing right. Or we can say, okay, how can I help these young people? How can I get the, the absurd number of st- statistics of people who genuinely really hate their lives right now and who are still in school for the most part, all those young kids that are just really struggling through school, how can I help them? And, and when I think to answer that question, that just brings me the greatest deal of satisfaction. It. And it's scary and it's exciting because I feel like I finally found something where I'm like, yes. <laughs> so early too. Oh. At 22, finding something that you really like, it's like a gift. But it, it, I wanna, it took a lot of work. Like it took yeah. me three years of constantly experimenting mm. or, or only to come back to the idea that, hey, maybe I just like helping people. Yeah. Maybe that's what I want to do. I mean, that's your, that's your <laughs> overall. I mean, you could, there's like why coaches that help you find your why. Yeah. And I've done it before and right. I don't know, it just felt like I was reading a horoscope. <laughs> but um, No, I, I would put those kinds of ideas, like I think they can help, but it's like buying a, a self-help course online. It can help, but it can't solve your life in the yeah, sense that at some point be, you just got to experiment. I think, I think you only, I'm trying to bring something up in a sec, but yeah. I think it's, it's a matter of just self-reflection to the point where your self-awareness grows and you're going, yes, mm. that's me. But it's also hard to reflect on yourself sometimes. You need someone externally to kind of validate in a way. Mm, um, definitely. But uh, the why, uh, wh- what is my why? What is my why? I'm trying to find what it. Is your why? Do you know your why? Have you, do you have like a, I've never, like a, no, like a self mission statement? 
Uh, no, nah, but if I had to take a guess, it would be. Let me hear yours and then I'll so, I feel like I might be wrong. It says, I'm most successful when I contribute and add value to people's lives. I am driven and focused, love to share stories and document my outcomes. I am selfish to the point of becoming selfless. I optimize people's lives. That's my mission statement. Wow. Okay. That is very, that's very well said. Mm. I didn't realize that it's got kind of a four tiered approach to it. It does. Can I ask just quickly about this, the selfless to selfish? What is that? What do you mean by that? Selfish to selfless. So selfish to selfless means when you, when you start this world, wherever you are, however you're born, whoever Mm. you're born as, whatever your beliefs are, whatever your parents, however, the, however your parents nurture you through the nature that they have provided, um, you're on your own eventually. Mm. And it's up to you to decide what you want to do with yourself, right? So a lot of people go, right, I need to help my parents. That's being selfless. They go, right, I need to help other people. That's being selfless. But at the end of the day, are you, look up, are you looking after yourself? Yeah. And you need to look after yourself first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the selfish part. Okay. Because if you're not looking after yourself first mm. and you let that deteriorate – your mental health or you're burnt out or you're physically unable to keep helping. Yeah. People say, okay, you, you know, you're a saint. You sacrifice yourself to, for the benefit of others. Mm. People can do that. People will do that every day. Yeah. But I feel that if you are selfish first and look after yourself and have yourself sorted, mm. you can prolong the selfless over time. I agree. And you don't burn out. So that comes down to... Are you, what you do, what you do, does it, is it fulfilling for you? Because you can be selfish because what you're doing, if it's helping others, but you don't have time for your family, yeah. that could be considered selfish to them. Yeah. Um, so there's a balance, right? And there's so many ways you can go about this. No, I, I like the, I like the yeah. model and I can kind of see that. I, I, yeah. I feel like I can picture you kind of you know, you build up this huge yeah. empire and then eventually you just like, boom, let, yeah. me, let me just save the world kind of thing. Exactly. So like with, with the last four or five years of my life with um, teaching and now mm. doing social media stuff and now teaching other businesses to do it, the teaching part is selfless. The me asking them for money is selfish technically, right? You do it out of the goodness of your heart, but I need to pay the bills too. Yeah. But if there's a clear understanding, that doesn't matter. But it's when people come and approach me and go, Seb, can you teach me how to do it? The selfish me will go, I don't have time or you need to pay me money. The self, selfless me will go, yeah, no problem. Let's see what you got. I'll help you. I'll give you some time. And that's subjective depending on the situation, who it is and things like that. <laughs> Um, but ultimately, I want to chase my philanthropic goals, which is mm. go out to speak to kids for free which makes it more selfless yeah. because I'm sacrificing my time or I'm donating my time because you can't get time back, right, unless you're Justin Timberlake. <laughs> and you're, um, you're doing that for the love of it. But that doesn't pay the bills. No. Nah. Unfortunately, we live in a society where we have to maintain, you know, a fuel, a, a, you know, tank of fuel in the car to get to these places that yeah. you talk. You have a roof of your head, your clothes, your food, your water. All these things require money to, you know. We don't live in a dystopian society where, you know, everybody just works together and we're in la-la land. Yeah. You know? You do have to – I totally agree because when I think about my own life, like for the last three years I haven't paid myself for for all the work that I've done at Elucidate, which is hundreds – like thousands and thousands of hours. Exactly. Um, And it's it's only now that myself and my co-founder where – you know, we're managing so many people. We're putting in so many hours. He works a full-time job and then just does this on the side, Yeah, which is just foolish. Is like, we're, we're finally getting to the point where it's like, okay, we need to pay ourselves as soon as possible. Otherwise this is just going to burn out. And in the long term, yeah. this organization won't exist. And we're just, it's all for nothing. Yeah. So, so this is where you have a business plan, yeah. you have an outcome, but your ultimate why of why you're doing it is for the benefit of others, right? Definitely. If you if you have a you want to monetize it, that's fine. But if you if you come at it that the ultimate goal is to monetize it first, yeah, you're looking. That's at it right. when people will go, "You're full of shit." <laughs> yeah. 
if the monetization is a byproduct, because yeah. it eventually happens, you mm. get an opportunity, someone will come up to you and say, hey, what you're doing here is amazing. Um, are you seeking any sponsorship? Yeah. There's your cash opportunity. Oh yeah, that's how we're doing it. Is, <coughs> exactly. Is getting, yeah, we're definitely not taking away from like, for instance, we sell all our textbooks. We've got a two for one donation model where for every two that we sell, like we produce and donate third goes to a low socioeconomic school. Um, so we don't take money out of our actual products or anything that we do. That's all very yeah. centered around that, but it's it's using sponsorships. It's using grants yeah. to say, hey, like we're trying to do our best yeah. here, but we do need something to survive. Yeah. Otherwise it's just not sustainable. Yeah, but and you can be selfless first. And yeah. then be selfish or the selfish part doesn't even like considered because they just offer it to you. Yeah. Like the, the, the book, Jab, 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 Right Hook mm. by Gary Vaynerchuk. That's what he talks about. He goes, give, 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 and then ask, right? And have no expectations of that ask because if you have expectations, that giving is actually not giving. Uh-huh. That's going, I'm building you up to a point where I can ask and if you don't give yeah. back, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> That's what most people are doing wrong. Okay. You need to give without any expectations. Yeah. And just enjoy it because you love doing it. Yeah. So that's the selfless part, right? But at the end of the day, you also need to pay the bills. Yeah. Right? So there's ne- there needs to be a way to do it. And what I've learned in content creation, it's like going around to all the different restaurants in the Perth and going, hey, I'd love to work for free. I'd love to take some photos, create some content or whatever, right? This morning, perfect example. There's a place across the road from my uh, house. Um, It's called Village Cafe something. And it's a South African shop. They've got amazing biltong there. And I went in there and grabbed some. And this was a few weeks ago, actually. The, the, The most recent time was today. After that first time a few weeks ago, I made a video got like 15,000 views on TikTok. It's not as big of a yeah, amount yeah. of views for my channel. Yeah, true. But 15,000 localized in Perth because I looked at the statistics. That's mm. a great pool. And I came back in this morning. The lady recognized me instantly. She goes, thank you so much for that video. Really? So many people came in and bought all the jerky. That's incredible. And I was like, and I paid for the jerky, right? And then she goes to me. I didn't even ask her. She goes, today I'm giving you $20 credit. And I got like $30 <laughs> and I paid for the extra $10. Yeah, so I yeah. went over and I got a coffee and I was stoked. That's right? so cool. I was selfless first. Yeah. And then they rewarded me, but I didn't even ask. Yeah. I had no expectations. I was, I was going in there today going, I'm dropping 20, 20 bucks yeah. or whatever on jerky and coffee. And that's <laughs> how I ship myself every morning. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> yeah. Coffee and jerky, but you know, keto, keto life. Yeah, I actually, I I can agree to that point Um, because I remember when I was, I went to a sponsorship meeting where we got, I think we got like $35,000 or something for, to help pay wages and stuff for for one of our staff member and buy some textbooks. But I just went in there, I I rocked up in shorts and a t-shirt. This was like a giant board meeting for this thing. I had no idea that they wanted funding. I thought they just wanted to meet to hear about what we do. And I just start telling them for 45 minutes, I just stand there and just like talking to them about everything that I want to do and, and what we want to accomplish. And then I get an email from them later. They're like, hey, here's some money, do it. And, and I had no idea. Yeah, dude, that's, that's it. But on, on that, a lot of people, I think it depends on where you are. So like if you're in a comfortable spot, I think act selflessly and then, but if, you know, if you're really struggling, you know, just it's about depending on where you are. Yeah, in the world. it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a sign of desperation. Like if you're doing this from a place where you, you need money or yeah. you're desperate to, to make the sale, you're going to come off a little bit more desperate. So that's why I always say, say to people, don't look for a job if you're unemployed. But no, uh, uh, by the time you're unemployed, look for a job while you still have another job. Yeah. Obviously that advice doesn't work for people who are already unemployed, you know, do your fucking hustle. Um, but like... When you have a job and you don't like it anymore, start looking for something else. Mm -hmm. And you do that by offering your services for free, like I said before, and you just speak from the heart, for the love of it. Yeah. People don't do that. And I'm like, it's not going to work for you. It's the same with dating as well. You said you're single. This is a pro tip. (laughs) See this ring? I mean, he's married. Girls can can see that. But I come in and, and speak confidently to women or whatever. Yeah. But as before as a single person, you're like, 
oh, you want to talk to them? You're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you're a little bit like, of course. You know, don't want to. You don't want to. Maybe if there's a connection, you don't want to ruin your chances. But now I'm just like, yeah, cool, sick. How you going? And they love it. They love it more because <laughs> you don't give a fuck. It's the same with business. So I come in. Um, just, one of one of my best sales ever. Yeah. Um, and I I came in with three different products. Yeah. And I sat down and the director was there, like the, the, the main guy. And I sat down and there was all these other people in there and I was just talking about what I do. Mm. And then at the end, and I came up with these prices at like the night before because my mate said, no, you got to put up the prices. And then sat down, did it, and I was expecting him to maybe choose one of them or maybe go, we'll, we'll think about it. Yeah, yeah. Stood up, shook my hand and goes, yep, let's do it. And I'm like... So which one do you want? (laughs) And he goes, all three of them. That's crazy. And the funny thing was, like, that wasn't even an option. Yeah. It didn't make sense. But he wanted all three of them. (laughs) And I'm like, fuck, okay, let's do it. That's sick. And I made 80 grand that day. So that was sick. And, But I didn't have any expectations going in because I just wanted to share that story. But, and this is what happens when you have a passion – Mm. You come in, you do your passion, someone else notices it, someone offers you some opportunity, then they pay you for it and you're like, how good's this? Yeah. And that passion's amazing. And then you get more and more and more opportunities, but then eventually you're working and that can be dangerous because your passion may go away because you're stressed about the pressure of delivering the product. Yeah. Before that payment, you weren't stressed because you were just doing it for the love of it. So now that's where I'm at, where I'm doing it. I used to do it for the love of it. I still am doing it for the love of it. But the money makes it a little bit more like, yeah, work. Yeah. And historically, three, four years into these ventures, I got to a point where I was like, this isn't fun. Yeah. I'm making lots of money, but I'm not having fun. So I would move on. And that's what I mean, like, you got to find something that you can push through to get to the point where you can evolve it, where you either sell it or you can find someone else to delegate it to, teach them and build a team to do it for you. And then you're up, you're in the background and you get to find, it's like the uh, restaurant analogy. You want to own a restaurant, great. Mm. But you need to make sure you're doing something for that restaurant that you love the most. You can't do everything. It's impossible. You can't be the waiter. You can't be the chef. You can't be the bartender. You can't be the manager. Yeah. And yeah, you can't be the cleaner. You have to delegate. But you can be one thing and one thing well. You want to be the head chef because you fucking love cooking? Do it. But you got to make sure you stay in that one lane because there's other people that do it. It's the same with every other job. That's what I've kind of learned recently. So more advice, whatever you're doing. Make sure you love it. But once you stop loving it, you still like it. Yeah. Start to delegate the stuff that you don't like about it. And just focus on the things that on you the love. On the one thing you love. Okay. That's, I like that. That's, that's, some, that's some advice I've learned recently and I've adapted it. Mm. And I'm like, you know what? I love creative direction. I love going out there and showing people what they need to do. Yeah. But then they can do it. Go for it. Mm. Right? Educator. Right? If you don't, if you can't do, you teach. Yeah, pretty much. And if you can't teach, you teach <laughs> kindergarten. That's what they say. Um, gym. Yeah, teach gym. Teach. Gym. I, I like that though. If you if you can't do it, teach it. That's yeah, like, that's but, like every guru out there. But that's the, that's the problem though, because like as a former teacher with an d- education degree, mm. I you know I used to be triggered by that comment, but then I realized, yeah. holy shit, most teachers don't fucking do they teach because they don't do anything else they landed in a cushy job that has a lot more responsibility than they think and then they just took a degree and go you know what this is the best i could do with my atar score and it's either marketing or this fuck it i'm gonna go or sports science uh, there's no sports science jobs i'm gonna do a dip head in school yeah and oh look i got a job how good's that uh, i don't actually know how to teach this subject. Oh, look, I'm teaching this other subject. That's how, that's how it works. That's so, um, and then when I realized that in the education system, I was like, well, that sucks. I mean, I'm here because I love teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I started uni at 24, right? Right, okay. Because I didn't want to go to uni. And the difference between me going at 24 versus 
literally most of the mostly all of the other teachers, mm. they were either in the school system from school. They finished high school, they went straight to uni. No gap year. Yeah. They finished uni, they went straight back into the school system yeah, and then they... to teach instead of instead of learn. They never had outside experience. They may have had shitty weekend jobs. Mm. They may have had a couple of holidays. But they never had a full-on couple of years, yet alone a handful of years that I had, including a successful personal training business that I built in that time. Yeah. I had all these extra life analogies. I've lived a little bit. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more because something I was doing in my degree is I went part-time. For yeah. one, for, I took my third year and I struck it out to like into two years. That was probably the best decision I've ever made in terms of – it freed up time because when you're studying a full-time degree, you don't have time to think. It's no. it's just constant, constant, constant study. Yeah, that's your life. You get a break, but you spend that whole time doing internships and kind mm. of working. Yeah. So you don't really get a moment to even think about what are the things you yeah. actually want to do. I think I think people need at least two years of two? gap. You reckon? People say take a take a gap year. No, no, no. You need two years. You need two full seasons. Would you say straight out of two school? Two years. Straight would, out of school. You reckon? Yeah. I would actually, because I think if if I could think back on my life, I think at eighteen, it's it's handy when you straight get out get straight out of school. But also, honestly, going mid degree is also not a bad choice as well. But then the problem is you'll probably end up changing your degree once yeah. you stop for two years. Well, the thing with um, two year gap is you get to travel. Yeah. If you, if you worked and saved money. If you're smart about it, yeah. And you get to taste test different in industries and go, right, which industry do I like that I could put up with? Yeah. Okay, it's not retail. Okay, it's definitely not hospitality and tourism. What else could I do? More corporate. All right, I did an admin job for six months. Those bosses looked a bit stressed <laughs> and they drink quite a lot of alcohol on Fridays. Yeah. Don't want to be them. Oh, look at that. Old mate had a heart attack at 53. Hmm. Maybe not. No. Oh, a doctor. Oh, shit. They got lots. They got a Mercedes and they got a nice house in uh, Apple Cross. <laughs> but man, they're stressed out of their minds. They're yeah. also drinking a lot. But, but something that I think we were talking about off camera, which I think might be interesting, which mm. is you can take a gap year. But the other thing you can just do in the meantime is spend 20 minutes a day just trying new things. Exactly. Which is, which is the theory that I have, which is try everything. Give everything a go. So let's say you have this faint idea that you want to do stand-up comedy. You know, just go go try a course. There's really no harm in it. And, you know, you don't have to take a full year off to do that. No. You can literally spend one hour a week just giving it a go. Yeah. And if you, so I think for a lot of people who, who don't have that luxury, maybe they're mid-degree at the moment or they're, they're in their jobs, so they don't have the time to go take a gap yeah. year. They can't be like, all right, kids, I'm just going to go <laughs> take a gap year. You've got to have a practical approach first so, to yeah. see. And then you go, if you're interested in the theory enough to see mm. how it works, then you go to uni for it. Yeah. But then then it goes to a conversation, not every job needs that degree. You don't need a marketing degree. Especially nowadays. You don't, need a, you don't need a film degree. I think it's, it's becoming so prevalent now with just seeing all my mates, the degrees they have versus the jobs they end up An in. An arts degree? You can Why? No disrespects to, you know, Whopper and stuff. But like, I feel like a lot of universities are going to go out of business in five years. Jordan Peterson actually said this, and I, I completely agree with him. Ever since he started talking about chat GPT, he's, going, he's saying stuff like universities are going to go out of business. And it's just because people can research shit so much quicker now than ever before in the history of the world. Yeah. The information is there that makes so many more things redundant. And that can be condensed into like... My writing, my mm. scripting, my ideas, brainstorming sessions have like a fraction, like one-tenth of the fraction of the time. One-tenth yeah. for everyone. It's crazy. It is crazy. But, but I think like, all right, what, what are the industries that you still need a degree for? You've got medical, you've got law. Consulting. like Engineering, medical, financial. Consulting. Yeah, finance. Finance. I think it will always have its place at university, but I do think unless they adapt, they will see jobs yeah. I think, <laughs> as they are. I think people are going to get smarter before they go to uni because I, I want this to happen. And not because I want to shit on unis. I just want people's self-awareness to be so much clearer before they get to uni that they know what they want to do. Because how it'd be an interesting stat to pull up. How, many, how much money is spent on a degree before you either pull out 
yeah. or it's not used at all. Yeah, and that would be a lot. Here's a study that I know universities will never back. Mm. How do we fix that problem where the money is wasted on that dropout or the lack of that degree? It's a funny one because I don't use my degree technically. Technically, yeah. But I have learned a lot from the time that I spent in that. And you can say that you can spend 30 to 50K learning on what not to do. Yeah. Um, but you can also grab the learnings from that degree and adapt them to the next journey. It's kind of what I'm doing now. Mm. And you can say it was worth it. You can say that was the path. And, you know, if it wasn't for uni, I wouldn't be on this path, which is true because if it wasn't for uni for me, I wouldn't have gotten a degree. I wouldn't have gone to school to teach and I wouldn't have had the year 10 kid show me what TikTok was, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Is that worth 30, 40 grand? I sure. mean, return on investment from that? Yes. Yeah. Um, do I still have a hex debt? Yes. <laughs> um, am I salty about it? A little bit. But... Um, you know, I, I, for the most part, for the most part, moral of the story is you, do not, you should not go to uni unless you had a bit of adult life experience and you've seen what's out there. Yeah. Because most of the time, and this is again from observation from my friends I went to school with who have went straight to uni, they have got nothing to do with their degrees at all, uh, for most of them, and, or they dropped out. And then the kids that do go to uni – they do it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. They don't know the day-to-day -day of the job that they're, they're, they're studying for. And when they get to that job, they hate that job. And I'm just like, you should have done your research further. You should all do work experience where you go, is that something you want to do for potentially 10, 20 years? Yeah. But Most I think the, time it's not. The, the problem with that, and I totally agree with the introspective yep. nature of it all. But you, you can't force kids to be introspective in the sense that if you don't actually set in the systems where they go get work experience, where they spend that time thinking about what they actually want to study, when they, because there's no time at the moment in school, for instance, to be able to actually think about what degree you do. That's, you know, that's on your own time. And, and kids aren't going to do that. Um, they're not, a lot of kids just don't have that kind of initiative or, or willingness to say, hey, no, let me sit in my thoughts. Let me think about what the day to day is. That's what I want to teach them. <laughs> I want to, I want to bring that in. I want to go, all right, let's talk about the Socratic method. Yeah. Why do you want to be an engineer? Are oh, your parents that said so? Do you agree with your parents? <laughs> is there something else that you'd rather do? What is your ultimate job? Describe me your perfect day on the job of your dreams. And what would it be? And some people would say travel blogger. Like, yeah. You can do that. It's saturated, but would you be willing to put in the work to do better than 99% of the travel bloggers out there? Mm. Most of the time it's no. It's like, is that really your passion? I want to be a YouTuber. Okay. Do you have a YouTube channel yet? No. Well, fuck. Why not? Because that shit's free. You want to be a YouTuber? You haven't started a YouTube channel yet? It's best mm, place to start. You know? But then if it's like, I want to be a pilot, I'm like, okay. Name me five films with, you know, airplanes in them. Now, that's the sort of obsession that I'm looking for that a kid can go fucking Top Gun, fucking yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, behind enemy lines or whatever. And I don't know. Um, Top Gun's, you know, all time. I actually watched <laughs> Top Gun when I was 10 or like a little bit younger and I fucking wanted to be a pilot because yeah. of that movie. Oh, it'd suck you in. It's then not. I had a growth spurt and I was like, fuck, cockpit, <laughs> cockpit's not for me. Um, and it's like in your childhood, I always, I always actually had a camera. I always loved taking photos. I was fascinated by Polaroids and really? all that stuff. But I didn't grab that self-awareness until later. Yeah. I always loved when Jackass came out. I was like, fuck, I want a camcorder. I don't want to do dumb shit right now. <laughs> I think every kid wanted to, but I actually did it, you know? <laughs> like I was doing stunts and stuff and, and, and I had like these little like two megabyte cameras. Yeah. You know, it looked like you're, you're, you're filming with a calculator and, and, and yeah, and I didn't get to, to realize that until later because I didn't have the resources. I started my YouTube channel when I was in – um, year 10. Did you cop it when you had a YouTube channel? Like nobody knew I had a YouTube really? channel. Okay. No, nobody knew I had a YouTube channel. I had one of the very first phones that weren't smart, didn't have internet, but yeah. you can record your, your videos on. Okay. And I put it on YouTube back then. God, I wish I could find the channel. I don't oh, know. Do you not have the videos anymore? I got to find it, but it's literally two megapixel bloody. Oh, it'd be so priceless. Pixelated. And it was like, I, I was filming everything. <laughs> 
Really? So just yeah. like day in the life, yeah. everything in between, yeah. little skits I can imagine yeah. and stuff? But I just didn't have someone telling me this is, this is your thing. You should <laughs> – I didn't have that self-esteem. No. No, it's hard and the to other make thing, that connection. The other thing I did was online tra- like trading, like, uh, like in-game trading, not, not like shares. Oh, right, okay. I was playing these games where you can trade items inside the game. I fucking love doing it. I love doing it. I frothed it and I was good at it. Yeah. And then I would be playing um, online, like the very first online games. And, you know, I could – I was doing that shit before PewDiePie was a thing, before Mr. Beast was a thing, you know, all those As guys. you were making videos about it or – I was I, I was one of the first to get an Elgato. Are you serious? To, to do all of that. I figured out how to do it. Before um, there was all the bef- tutorials? Like when it was just starting. Yeah. That's crazy. I have I have clips of me getting nukes oh. in in every second Call of Duty, and I was obsessed. And this was before streaming was really thing. This is before Twitch came out. Yeah. The only problem was I lived in Kalgoorlie, right. and my dreams were crushed because I didn't have enough bandwidth to um, stream and record at the same time. Right. You okay. know. And that was, that was a bit of a shitty one. And then I moved here and I lived in uh, a suburb called Padbury. Yeah. And the, they didn't get NBN until like 2018 or something, 2019. They were like one of the last suburbs in the fucking suburb, in the, in the state to get it. Mm. It's like a black hole on my suburb, which was frustrating because I remember 2016, 2017, I had built a PC. And it was ready to go. I had everything. I invested everything. And this is when I was at peak uni as well. Yeah. And I was like, I'm ready to go. We tested it, but I was lagging. <laughs> I was lagging. My, I, was playing my, I was playing Call of Duty, but the streaming was poor. It was terrible. So, you know, download, upload at the same time, you, you're going to fuck it. So that dream died. But now it's, I have the opportunity again, being here in the yeah. studio, in the city, with city... Um, internet speeds. Did you forget about it until you started actually getting, like when you were a teacher and stuff, did you kind of forget about all of that in the meantime? Yeah, I had something else to do. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm more money driven. Like I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing can get me to buy my time back as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, yeah, by making as much money as possible, as quickly as possible. I've got patience. Yeah. But if I'm doing something that isn't making me money, like the podcasting, like what we're doing here technically isn't making me money. Not right? yet. But. Not yet. But I love doing it and it's my kind of alternative to the gaming stuff. Ah. So I get to learn from you. I get to meet with you yeah. and all the other guests and who knows. Ten years from now, you're a mogul and you go, <laughs> Seth, I want to fly you out. Oh, let's, 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 <laughs> let's record this bit. I want to fly you out and I want you to speak to my people. Right? Sounds like a plan. No deal. And... And, you know, that's the sort of – and no expectations either, but, like, that's the sort of thing that I enjoy doing more right now rather than going online, setting up Twitch and going, all right, let's play fucking Warzone or something. And, yeah, 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 You know, try and get the dub. There's no value in that. Well, I think when you, when you look back on, on your own life in, in terms of what had to happen, if – let's say you did become a full-time streamer and you, and you pursued gaming – was that your life's purpose? Whereas exactly. nowadays you're older, you yeah. can actually give back through the content that you're producing and make yeah. things that are of benefit to young people. I think the universe looked after me back then in a funny way where he said, you know what, you're in Kalgoorlie, fuck your internet speed. <laughs> you're going to move back to Perth, fuck your internet speed still. Yeah. Because we are not here to do this. This is not your purpose. Mm. And, you know, I, I do believe in all that shit, the whole purpose thing. And I look back and reflect and go, holy shit, if that had happened, yeah. I would not be here doing this. But the, you'll never know the alternative. So you can't dwell on the alternative. So the no. alternative is me going back, building the PC, and 2016, my internet speed's elite. I dominate Rocket League, Call of Duty, and all that shit. And, pop off. and make, I don't know, an extra $1,000, $2,000 a month or whatever yeah. doing that. Maybe I pop off. Maybe I become an elite gamer. Maybe the personality could have grown. And then after all of that, I'm invited to a, an event in Melbourne to compete, walk across the street and get hit by a bus. <laughs> That's such a horrible way to look at it. But yeah. You know? No, but, I think you're on the right yeah. path. I think one theory that I have in all that, which is um, 
I think it's the type of person, because like when I think back to all the things, if they did happen versus if they didn't happen, if certain things that I thought were good at the time happened to me, my life would be on a horrible trajectory. But yeah. the theory I have is, is certain people are very tenacious and always kind of go after everything that they want to do and, and, and take on initiative constantly, which is what you do. Yeah. And as a result, you end up always having the best iteration of your life, like in the sense yeah, that- yeah, yeah. It's just the type of person, which is no matter what happens, no matter what failed, like even if certain things didn't fail. Someone's, someone's fan belt is yeah, go on not nuts. living its best life. <laughs> I thought it was a hard drive. But yeah. The but yeah, I think just it's the this, it's this certain person because I always look back and I think everything that's happened, I'm really glad has. Mm. And the only reason I reckon that's happened is because like I'm always going after things and just giving things a go. I love it. And that's the type of person. That's it. And that's the thing with my um, sort of uh, um, the gaming. Yeah. The gaming path. If I really wanted it badly, I would have still made it work. Oh, have, so, you, have you seen game? Like, I'm not saying you wouldn't make it, but have you seen the gaming community nowadays and how oh, it's actually kind of disgusting how much they play? Like it's, oh, it's, they grind like 12 hours a day, 14 hours. Yeah, but why non-stop. do they grind? Do they grind to get really good? Yeah, yeah, yeah to get good. See, I wouldn't. You'd be uh, a content man. Yeah, yeah, I would be. I would be funny stuff. Okay, okay, okay. Like programming is uh, nuts. Yeah, nowadays. Like Laser Beam, he got really oh, good yeah. at Fortnite, and <laughs> you know um, all those other guys, and then they have a personality or whatever. But how they're doing it, I don't know. Like whatever they're doing, and the, yeah. well, the not, Logan not, Pauls and the KSIs, they're all entertainers. Yeah, they're not getting views because they're good at. Yeah, um, gaming. <laughs> so, like, look at it outside of gaming. Look at it in sport. Which which sportsmen are the most not- notable? The ones with personalities. The True. ones that are the most marketable. Which musicians are the most successful? Not the most talented. The ones yeah. that are most marketable. That's <laughs> the fucking truth. So, am I saying I've got 1.5 million followers on TikTok because I'm the most talented? Maybe not. Maybe it's because I'm the most marketable. I stand out, literally, being tall as fuck, you know, it helps. It's like everyone's going to notice that guy. Let's put him up. Let's put him up uh, above everybody else. Um, but, yeah, so utilizing that, but, but utilizing that gift for good. Yeah. You know, being six foot ten, like how many other famous people do you see at, at six ten apart from basketball? Yeah, I was about to say that. But, you know? uh, but those basketballers, right. like even them, they, they go out into the wind. Yeah. Like um, – Hassan Whiteside, when was the last time you heard about his name? Exactly. Did you even know he left the league? No, he fucking smoke bombed. But that's what I mean. Like the most marketable player of all time in basketball was Michael Jordan. He is still Michael Jordan. He made more money this year and last year oh, than I he did. I saw that start. That's yeah, crazy. He makes more money every year than he did in his entire basketball career combined. And that's the business side of it. So if you have a marketable character in yourself, mm. you need to get around the right people who are not going to dog the boys, yeah. dog you and take advantage of you like Elvis, Elvis's uh, manager did mm. and push forward and, so you can survive. Um, Conor McGregor, another example. You know? Pretty iconic. Absolute prime fighter. Yeah. Got too cocky and... You know, got lots of cash and still a great dude. Yeah. Like I value, I value him. I vibe with him. And, you know, he, he was there to take over. He wasn't here there to take part. He was there to take over. So then, um, so then what happened was um, he got into the alcohol business. The proper 12, the Irish loser. And he made so much money from that. Now he's doing something with the, um, the, um, the pints, the, the, dark, the dark lagers. Right. Um, the Stein, the Steins. I'm sure and, it's doing well. And now he just released something recently, another proper 12 whiskey um, apple flavor. And the way he promotes it was genius. He comes out like he's Steve Jobs un- <laughs> unveiling the iPod for the first for time. A bottle of whiskey. <laughs> Literally, it was perfect. It was so good. But I think above all else, he's just himself when you actually exactly. think about it. Exactly. He's he is no himself. one other than himself and that's the key. And he's built his own brand and he's monetized his own brand perfectly so that now that he doesn't even have to fight anymore, yeah, he makes so much more money than he ever will fighting. But that's what people need to do nowadays. Like if you can build a brand around yourself, you need to do it from the heart. Mm. You can't do it from, right, when I get enough followers, I'm going to ask them all to buy merch. 
you haven't deserved that right. They need to discover your merch and buy it anyway. You know, Mr. Beast has done done it perfectly. Yeah, he's done it for for like I think it was like I think he's seven years in or maybe a little bit more, almost ten years in now. He's been doing it for that long before asking his audience for anything. To buy, but now they just eat out of his hand. Literally, the chocolates, the burgers. He's, uh, it's incredible what he does, though. In, yeah. in my opinion, yeah, I think no, be, absolutely. You know how everyone, everyone good usually somehow becomes bad. Like you, they, there's some dirt that gets brought up on him. Of He's course, like one of the few people that have really kind of kept that. Yeah, that straight line. I vibe with him, but that's that's what I mean. Like he's very careful, and you know he's got the right people behind him. Yeah, and he, you know his intent is pure. Um, but like the prime drink that's coming out, mm. it's like. You're you're clearly pushing that, and the kids take it, but they love KSI. Logan yeah. Paul's a piece of shit, apparently. Um, so I've I think heard. you need the duo. One you without the other, it wouldn't have worked. No, um, but again, it's it's perfectly executed. But that's marketing. Okay. So now I'm just thinking, okay, how do I do it, and why why do I want to do it? Start an energy drink. Or I don't something? want to fucking start <laughs> an energy drink. I don't really want to do anything consumable. One because it's a lot harder. And I'm not afraid of hard work. Yeah. I'm just going, well, there's a lot of laws and fucking regulations you have to pass. Yeah, you need a whole team What if that. I have an education tool that I can, you know, like you've got your books, right? Cool. What if I develop something where the kids can easily, you know, organize themselves at school? Yeah. You know, like. Well, you got experience there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, maybe that's something that I'll do. Maybe it's a PDF. Maybe it's, you know, digital download everybody can grab. And sell it for two bucks. Yeah, make a Skillshare course. And have you seen people make so much money off Skillshare? Yeah. It's insane. But 10 million people buy those PDFs. It's $20 million or $3. Yeah. $3, you got 30 million. There's your 30 million. It's as easy it is. But that's, that's where, you know, people need to see the value beyond belief. And they go, I want to buy that. What does that get me as well? What's mm. the difference between me owning it and someone just pirating it? Pirating it. You now people started doing all that NFT shit the last two years, and it was yeah. just all fucking waste of time and money. But it can be done properly. It's it just ninety nine percent of the the NFTs are full of shit. Yeah, because the intent is we want to make money. Oh, I love listening to it all. Like I, I listen to a bunch of just like crypto people and, and people like Coffeezilla, and they kind of just talk about how. Like whole the, the whole NFT market was just pumped, and it's just so funny to see what because people just when you have a pure financial motive, like mm. what extent you're willing to go to to just crush humans, like yeah. they just don't care. They don't give a fuck. They're just like, cool, give me your money. Well, if they wanna, they won't be, they won't be happy later in life because probably not. You know, it's like you start up a you start up something that takes advantage of people's addictions, oh. and you make lots of money yeah. from it. Yeah, you're successful if you're if you're you know um, scaling it from uh, from a point of your bank balance. Mm. But deep down, how did you make your money? Oh, yeah. people's gambling addiction, <laughs> and that's why I hate gurus because I think for the most part they kind of pry on people who who have nothing, who really hate their lives, and then like, hey, I'm going to sell you this course, five hundred bucks, change your life, and obviously won't, never does. Otherwise, they'd have genuine. That's why I don't have stories. a course. <laughs> That's why I don't have a course. I mean, the Skillshare you can do it thing, right? Yeah, but it's when they do the sales funnels and they they get you in, they trap you, they make you join yeah. their inner circles, and and at the end of the day, those people just became wealthy off of the wealth of poor people who just are looking for a way out. Yeah, exactly. I I have an obligation to myself that everybody that j- jumps on and and learns with me needs. To get some success. I mean, a yeah. lot of it, they need to come to the table too. Of course. And as a t- I'm, I'm, I'm empathetic to the kids. If I give them work to do mm. and I teach them how to do it, but they still don't do it, I feel like I failed still to not motivate them or instigate them enough or manipulate them yeah. in a positive way for them to go, yeah, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it because I see the value in it. Whereas now I've got, you know, my consulting and all that stuff and people, you know, take an hour session with me every week or whatever and I give them actions, accountability, the same course. thing as I did at school. And then they don't do it. Did they get a refund? No. I've got, that's their fault. That's, that's their, their fault, fault. That's... you know. But I'm also reflecting and learning and going, okay, how do I make them do that better next time? And it's deja vu from when I was a personal trainer. Yeah. You come in two, three times a week – 
with me. But if you eat shit when you get home and yeah. you're sedentary for most of the time, we're at best plateauing. We're at best just maintenance. Yeah. But you come to me in the last six months and that's all you did. We're maintaining where you are from the beginning. We haven't moved. You haven't gotten fatter, but you haven't gotten anywhere closer to your goals. It, so I think the, the good sign of um, – I think this kind of stems back to the idea of leadership, which is a good leader kind of – even if someone's not making change, they, they take the blame on themselves in the sense that it's like, okay, I do that. what am I doing wrong? Why so, is that person not doing the work? So I think that's my next part of my personal journey is if I was to create a course, how do I make sure that everybody uses gets it. uses it but, but it, it makes an impact on their lives? Yeah. You know? Otherwise, I'm going to be straight up with them. Are you yeah. going to do it? And that could be a sales pitch as well. Before they get to the checkout, there's a little questionnaire that stops them going, are you actually going to use this? Do you promise? That's a good one. If, I was, to, if I was to email bye, you 30 bye, bye. days from now, would you be able to prove to me that you did it? You know? Yeah. And maybe people go, oh, fuck, probably not. Click <laughs> out. But that's fine. Yeah. You know? So, you know, a potential marketing idea. But um, yeah, most people are full of shit. Like most of those gurus are full of shit. Yeah, it's, it's basically goal setting yeah. and glorified. Yeah, he's glorified goal setting. He's had to get 100,000 followers from TikTok <sighs> yeah. in a month. I'm right, okay, tell me more. <laughs> so you do this, 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 and this. I'm like, okay, cool, all right. So your demographics clearly people that just want to get lots of followers. What about if it's a specific business? Yeah. How do you leverage that following? There's so much more to it. And then all these people are eating off the, out of the palms of these gurus' hands. And then when I come in and go, hey, I can actually help you. They're like, mm, can you? The last person couldn't. Yeah. Like, all right, well, let's talk about it. So a whole lot of other shit. But <laughs> um, did you bring your books? Oh, shoot. No, I didn't bring the books. That's a horrible part on, point on my end, eh? That is de definitely bad. So um, – <sighs> Jack's meant to bring his chemistry and maths books that he wrote. I was. We were meant to show them, but it's okay. We can put them Digitally in the up. description. In the Man. description. Yeah. <laughs> God, today's been a hectic day. I didn't even, that didn't even cross my mind. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> um, so you're off to Bali tomorrow. Yeah. Chilling out. Chilling out. Great. With, by yourself, with your parents? Uh, with everyone. Oh, I'm going Ooh. with a bunch of family friends. So just – Nice. Yeah, I feel like it's a long-deserved break. I haven't had a break in a long time. Um, yeah. So it's going to be nice. It's only for like five five days or something, but definitely be chilling out, surfing a lot. And Ooh. trying to get good again. Sounds like fun. I haven't surfed in so Is long, it good so. surf in Bali? Yeah, well, from my basic opinion of it all. But yeah, yeah I'm not like some expert level surfer. Yeah, cool. But yeah. So you're starting You're starting your path. You started your path, but you're still, still, still very starting. You're going to get a lot of these comments from older people. It's an old person thing to say. <laughs> Um, if you were to tell yourself on your last day of high school something, what would it be? Man, I, I think it would be just to, to – I think the one thing that has worked best for me is having a great attitude towards everything. I, I'm really of the belief that in order to, to get to where you want to go and in order to bring the right people into your life – it all comes back to having a great attitude, um, yeah. which is just for me, just going out, being incredibly positive, being incredibly nice to people all the time, always being excited about the things that I'm doing, even if I'm not necessarily mm. always there. And, and as a result of that, I've just found that I've been able to shift away from all the negative things in my life and, and bring the right things in. So definitely having a great attitude is for me. Nice. And it's a simple one because... The reason I'm saying that is because you can give so much advice, but a lot of it's so circumstantial, whereas a great attitude is, is, is not circumstantial. It's a decision. You know, you can be a billionaire and have a terrible attitude or you can be, a, be in a third world country and have the best attitude. So, so that's the advice I'd give. Right on. And, <laughs> um, and uh, if you were to tell yourself, uh, if you, you were to tell your 32-year-old self, no, rephrase 30. that. If you were to ask your 32-year-old self a question, what would it be? Oh... Okay, what was, what was the biggest, I think I would ask them like, what's the biggest source of happiness in, in your 20s? What is the thing that really mattered in your 20s? Like I'd ask myself that, Jack, what mattered the most? And then I would go for that. That's what I'd ask. Nice. I could say to you, <laughs> okay, as a 32 year old, it would be time. Time. Time matters the most and how you utilize it. 
Did you have you always understood that, or is that only come no, recently? No, nah, more recently. So my twenties, and this is something that you can do. Yeah, you learn it, and I feel like I'm like fuck. First five years of my twenties, I could have done so much more. Yeah, and True. I would I would swap places with you in a second. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, like at 22, I was uh, what was I doing? Starting, starting, like really getting into my footy. Um, I had a personal training business by then, uh, but I was barely, barely surviving because I had a loan, a car loan that was fucking dumb. Yeah, and I was trying to figure Wait, out what how car to, did you buy? That's... VE Commodore SS. Yeah, okay. it's like nine hundred and sixteen dollars a month down the drain, and um, I was learning how to have housemates. Different housemates. Yeah. So that was interesting. But I, any spare time that I had, I didn't utilize it at all. Right, you just but I, I, yeah, but I, had, I, I was busy. I was a personal trainer. I had a girlfriend. I had a footy and I had a, you know, other shit that I did. Yeah. But I had so much spare time that I just didn't realize I had spare time. Until you don't have it. Until you don't have it. So yeah, I don't think when people get full-time jobs, then they're like, oh, shit. Yeah, but you sound you're pretty busy anyway, so, you yeah, know. Um, but I enjoy it. Yeah, as long as you enjoy it. Like for me, I didn't enjoy it, but I pivoted, pivoted, pivoted until I'm here. Yeah. Do I enjoy it now? I do, more so than I did before. Could I enjoy it better? I could, but that's my path and that's what I'm trying to figure out. So, And that's what I mean by you, like how to find your own path. Oh, how to, I don't even know. That sounds like I'm brainstorming for the title of this <laughs> podcast. What do you reckon, Ryan? What's the title of this podcast? He's gone to sleep. <laughs> he's, he's on three hours. He's on three hours, my <laughs> bad. Sleepy. Ryan, Ryan's, Ryan's uh, actually uh, a zombie today. <laughs> so, yeah, um, thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me, man. How, how do we find everything about you? Where do, we, where do we stalk you? Yeah, I think just stalk me on LinkedIn is probably the best place to get me. All or, right. Um, like that's where you'd find all the links to all the stuff that I'm working on at the moment and all the books that I've written. But, um, you know, if you want to, if they want to act, if they're in kids in high school or teachers, um, definitely just go to www.elucidate.org.au and you can see all our platform and just get involved. And, and if anyone's out there that's a uni or anything and wants to get involved in some pretty sick projects, in my opinion, hit, hit us up. So, yeah. Perfect. You know where to go. Thanks for watching, listening, leave a five-star review if you if it deserves it if it doesn't deserve five-star review don't because it fucks up the ranking <laughs> um subscribe on youtube if you haven't if you're listening to it on spotify if we monetize this then i can do more of this shit for fun for longer for more guests i'm gonna try and ramp this up to a couple of guests a week but until then thanks for watching listening commenting loving good thanks <laughs> <laughs>